I will be reading Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Last Sunday, we focused on this concept of resolve and the resolve that we see in Jesus as he draws near to Jerusalem, especially as described in Luke chapter 9. We talked about the fact that when you know time is short, priorities get reshuffled. And things that are extraneous, things that are ancillary, uh, things that will not be of great importance further down the road get pushed to the margin of our consciousness, sometimes pushed beyond the edge of the page of our consciousness, simply because we focus, we simplify, we, we minimize, uh, we boil things down to those things that are most important. Luke 9.51 tells us that uh, when it uh, came time for Jesus to be delivered, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was resolute. He was determined. There was a purpose. There was an aim. And everything fed like tributaries into that primary aim and goal. And we talked about the fact last Sunday being the first Sunday of a new year that it's an appropriate time for us to introspect and consider our own resolve. And if needed, which it's always needed, to re-up on some resolutions, whether those be spiritual in nature, spiritual goals, daily time with God in spiritual disciplines, in, in reading, in prayer, in more boldly and actively sharing our, our lives of faith with other people, and not just determining to lead someone, uh, helping someone complete their journey of faith that leads to salvation in Jesus Christ, uh, not just anyone, but someone in particular someone by this name, someone that I know, someone that I love, someone in my family, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, and diligently seeking God in prayer that we would be emboldened and enabled to intentionally take actions and share words that would help influence them through deeper saving faith in Jesus Christ. One of the activities that I'm loving right now in, in this quarter is teaching the three o'clock Wednesday afternoon class again. This is something that Scott and I rotate on a quarterly basis through nine months of the year. We take the summers off, but this started two, three years ago just during standard time in the winter to provide some of our older members or anyone really who wanted to, to be able to come to a midweek Bible study and not have to worry about coming here in the dark, much less driving home in the dark. And after we went back to daylight saving time the next spring, the members of the class wanted to just keep meeting. And so we do that now uh, from the fall through, through the spring. And uh, continue to pray for Scott and Jerry as they are in Cambodia. I think they get back into the country next Sunday. And I know they're having a wonderful time with, with Rich and Rhonda. But since, uh, and, and Scott and I generally just teach in the afternoons what we're teaching that night. So currently I'm teaching an evening study on the book of Psalms. And so we're doing that in the afternoon as well. But as a result of our discussion last week on being resolute going into a new year, uh, Del Huntsman approached me after class and just, it, I think she had written it on a bulletin 
uh, which I've cut and pasted or uh, uh, pared that down a little bit from the paper she wrote it on. And she just handed me a list of six things that she wanted to be resolute and determined about this year. So I called her later in the week and I said, could I share that with everybody? You know, could, could we let everybody know what you want to do this year? And this is what she said, that she wanted to read the book of Psalms five times this year. She wanted to read the book of Isaiah, that she wanted to be more conscious of counting her blessings, that she wanted to look for the good, to keep her thinking straight, and to be more aware of God's presence. So, um, if you want to save yourself some effort, just take Dell's list. Um, Dell, that, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for not only sharing that with me, but giving permission to share that with everyone this morning. And let me encourage you to do that, uh, to follow her sweet example and her sweet spirit in wanting to, at the stage of life she is in, even walk more closely with Jesus than, than she has in the past. And what a tremendous example and what a, a tremendous encouragement to us. I'll be pulling these on and off throughout the morning. Wanted to let you know that Tim's Big Boy Glasses 2.0 have been ordered and should be here maybe Tuesday. So I, I will be happy to be done with these hopefully in a few days. Uh, back in 1994, uh, Kim and I moved to Florence, Alabama to work with the Chisholm Hills Church there. That was 24 years ago. Uh, Hannah was three, Coleman was 10 months. In fact, we started 1st of January, uh, February 19th. And next month, we would celebrate his first birthday there. And located between where the church building was and our house, which was out in Killen, Alabama, I had to drive right by, or very, very near uh, the YMCA. So we, we took out a, a family membership there, and it was easy for me to, leaving the office late afternoon, at least three or four days a week, go by the Y and try to get in a workout. It was not only good physically, but, but mentally as well, and emotionally, just sort of burn off the activities of the day, uh, occasionally the frustrations of the day, uh, in, in a good lather of sweat. And one of the things that, uh, this was the YMCA uh, that happened to have up near the track that I'm going to tell you about, over to the side was a free weight area, and not this particular rack of dumbbells, but one like it, posted above which was the sign that said, please put dumbbells in their proper place. <laughs> and I've, I still get a kick at, out of that sign. Please put dumbbells in their proper place. But one of the things that I enjoyed most about it was that it had a track like this. You know, there's some basketball courts down below. You could use it for volleyball. You could use it for other indoor games. But there was a track on the upper level that was a twelfth of a mile. Um, you know, a standard track around a football field is a quarter of a mile, so four laps, you get in a mile. This one took three times as long to get in a mile as far as laps was concerned. Twelve laps would give you a mile. And as you got to the top of the stairs, when the free weight area was over here and you could hit, hit the track, there was a sign posted with uh, directional arrows. On Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, uh, the flow was to go counterclockwise around the track. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, uh, the, the flow of traffic was to go uh, clockwise. And I don't know if that was just to break the monotony or if it was to allow you to have even wear on the soles of your shoes and, and your knees, you know, if you constantly, you know, if you went every day and constantly made left turns, I guess that would have an effect eventually, so let's, let's balance this out. But that was how things worked. That's the way things were supposed to be. So one Thursday afternoon, I had uh, changed clothes in the locker room and gone up to, I, I was, as I was stretching to get ready to go on the track, I noticed there was only one person on the track. It, it was a woman. And this, this was Clockwise Thursday. Clockwise Thursday. And I, you, know, you couldn't help but notice that she's not going clockwise around the track. She's going counterclockwise. So I'm facing a bit of a dilemma as I'm stretching. You know, 
It's Thursday. I know which way you're supposed to go. The sign is clear. What do I do? Do I do what I know is right and good and expected and lawful? Or do, do I just join her in, in going the other way? I didn't want to make this uncomfortable for her or me or awkward or embarrassing to every time around the track, yet you never met people face to face on that track if everybody did what they were supposed to. And I couldn't imagine every lap, you know, just having to avoid eye contact. Uh, maybe she was new. Maybe she was distracted, uh, preoccupied with, with other thoughts, just, just wasn't paying attention. You know the experience, you just forget what day it is sometimes. But being distracted will cause you to do a lot of things, you know, like put a gallon of milk, set it in the pantry instead of the refrigerator, or lay your phone down in the refrigerator when you're putting something back, or leave your Bible on the hood of the car when you pull out of the uh, parking lot. I've never done any of those things. But <laughs> if you are distracted, if you're preoccupied, you know, in, in your mind, you, you can easily do thoughtless things like that. So I decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. And this wasn't something of, you know, a huge significant nature. It wasn't going to hurt the economy or shift the balance of geopolitical power in the world. So what's it going to hurt? I just fell in, you know, behind and off we went. And as we were making laps around the track, I noticed that others got to the top of the stairs and had that look of confusion and perplexion on their faces as well. Because they know it's Thursday, and they see the sign, and they look at us, and they go through the, the same mental exercise that I had done. It wasn't worth it to them either. They just fell in, you know, and everyone starts going the wrong direction. The pressure to conform was just too great. And so they caved into something and threw their lot in with something that they knew was incorrect, but the risk of conf uh, confrontation was calculated to be just a little bit too high. So there we all went, human sheep, silly human sheep, all but one of us, knowing that we were going in the wrong direction, but each lacking the courage to turn around, which gave false confidence to the first lady on the track and kept increasing the likelihood that those who followed would join us in going the wrong direction. I've wondered since if cameras had been mounted around the track that day by the psychology department over at the University of North Alabama, which was nearby, as some human behavioral uh, experiment, something like that. It wouldn't surprise me if that had been done because I, I thought about it a lot as, as we went around the track. The text that was read for us a few moments ago from Jesus' teaching on, on the Sermon on the Mount culminates uh, in that section with this challenge to consider the direction we're going, the path that we're taking, the destination uh, toward which we are moving. And it's preceded in, in those verses that were read before it, starting at verse 1 of, of chapter 7, where I, I think Jesus is really challenging us to commit to these values that are going to be a huge part of which of those roads we take. And so in that first section, the, the first couple of verses about not judging so that we won't be judged, knowing that by the standard of measure we used, it will be used in judgment of ourselves by other people. That's typically the way it works in this world, uh, but also by, by God. And rather than focusing on some minor flaw in someone else's life to the neglect of a glaring moral failure in our own. I think the challenge is here, be introspective. Certainly be humble and don't be hypocritical, but be intro before inspection of others, let there be introspection of yourself. Before you inspect, introspect. So be introspective. Uh, be discerning in a spiritual sense, be discerning and discriminate. Discrimination based on externals is just flat wrong. It's flat immoral. It's evil. But spiritually speaking, in discerning between good and evil, we do need to be discriminant. And there are those who will appreciate what is sacred and holy, and there are those who aren't, uh, who, who won't be. 
who won't acknowledge that value and that importance. And so Jesus says, as you're being introspective, be discerning, be discriminate, uh, be bold and confident in your prayers, in your asking, in your seeking, in your knocking. Be, be trusting that your father loves you and he knows what he's doing, like we trust our earthly fathers and mothers and know that they want what's best for us. They know how to give good things to us. Um, things like bread, things like fish, not scorpions, not stones, not things that, that would bring us harm. So if we, being evil, being human, being fallible, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? So be bold. Be confident in your prayers. Be gracious and merciful. I think that's at the heart of whatever you want others to do to you and for you, do the same toward them. Uh, and I think at the heart of that is being gracious and merciful with other people because that's what we want from them is grace and mercy. Not being snippy and snarky and hateful and dismissive or haughty, or brash, or condescending, or critical, generally cranky and disagreeable. I started wondering, does anybody really think that that's what that means? You know, that that's what God wants? Is, do we want that from anybody else? I started wondering if there was a translation like the, uh, the YWV, the yeah, whatever version. Uh, is, is that how the fruit of the Spirit reads in the yeah, whatever version? Uh, well, that may work here, but it doesn't work in the mind of God. It doesn't work in the heart of Jesus. Nobody, nobody, if you're just honest with yourself, no one wants to be treated that way. No one wants that attitude or those words or, or that behavior from anyone else. So why on earth would we, with any regularity at all, be that way with other people? So at the heart of this, I think, is be gracious, be merciful with others. And then he gets to this concept in verses 13 and 14. If you choose to do those things, that's going to put you in a minority of people in this world. Not just these things, but other kingdom teaching, kingdom values from the Sermon on the Mount. That's going to set you apart from the mass of the flow of humanity. And it's going to put you in a committed, determined company who are devoted to this notion of the values of the kingdom of God. And so verses 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, the gate's wide, the way is easy that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. This is reminiscent of... Uh, some Old Testament background, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Moses says, near the end of his life with his parting charge to Israel, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that, that you may live, you and your descendants. All the statutes, all the ordinances, all the commandments basically boil down to a simple choice, life and death, blessing and condemnation. And I'll let you choose which one you want. But the choice is indeed yours. Part of the um, remembrance and, and tribute to Ken Hancock on Friday uh, was the, the reading of, of a eulogy that his children had written in his honor and uh, son Paul and son-in-law Paul both read prayers and son J.D. Uh, read scripture. And J.D., the, the first passage that you read was, was this one, I believe. And then from 2, Corinth, 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. But there's a, a beautiful description about two lives. Uh, we know which one Ken chose, which one Ken followed. Uh, two lives two choices, two destinations. 
Psalm reads, Psalm 1 reads, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked, the other path, the other mindset, other attitude, other philosophy of life, the wicked are not so. They're not like that firmly rooted and grounded tree. They're like the chaff. The husks of the grains of wheat that are driven away by the wind. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked, the way of the righteous. That's the way it's always been. And then Jeremiah 21, 8. Thus says the Lord, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. It's almost like God thinks this is important for us to know. Because he just keeps saying it over and over and over again. There's a wrong way. There's a way of disobedience. A way that ignores the posted signs. A way that leads to eternal destruction and separation from God. And remarkably, it's traveled by many. And if, if you're just going on percentages, if you're just looking for what seems to be advisable to most people... You might be misled into thinking that this is the way to go. Because like on the track that day, as more and more people got to the top of the stairs, I'm sure part of their mental process was, I think I know which way I'm supposed to go, but how, how could this many people be wrong? How could this many people, you know, collectively not be going the right way? So we second guess, counter to our conscience, counter to our heart, counter to our better judgment. We second guess because how could that many people be wrong? And yet scripture says it can and does happen. You know, I think about the, you know, the, this broad way. Um, what, there are things I miss about living in the Metroplex where we lived for 12 years. Traffic is not one of them. But, you know, I remember, you know, LBJ Freeway. And especially, you know, when I think of broad ways and, and these, these wide gates, you know, um, turning off of LBJ onto where it intersects with 121 just north of the airport there and then going into DFW airport. You know, all those booths that you can go through. Back in 92, I drove to Chicago to look into a, a theological school up in Deerfield and visited with some cousins in Indiana then drove up through Terre Haute. And I don't know what the interstate that I, wa that I hit there near Gary, Indiana. Went west for a while and then, you know, turned north. I was trying to bypass Chicago and I was trying to watch the road. You know, I'd never been on a road that wide, that many lanes. And then there were more toll booths than I'd ever seen in my life. And, you know, you just, just picked one. And then when you got through the toll booth, when you had paid your toll, it was just like a racetrack. You know, it was just wide open pavement and you gunned it and then it kind of came into 12 lanes or something further on, on down there. That's how I envision this broad road that leads to destruction. You know, it's pretty easily navigated. You, you just sort of go with the flow. And there's also this true way, this right way, a way of submission to God and obedience to him. A way that heeds the divinely posted signs and it's a way that, that leads to life. And I, I think about those, those county roads down, down in Texas, the farm to market roads, except this is not an FM road, this is an EH road, the, the earth to heaven road. And this disparity between the number of one that's on the number of the other is simply based by our choice, not God's design. God didn't design it that way. There was only one path that he wanted us to follow. 2 Peter 3, 9, God's not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2, 4, God our Savior desires all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth um, and to make sure that we got where he wanted us to go. He built the road for us. Uh, another wonderful thing to learn about Ken you know, from that, that eulogy that his children wrote was what he did for much of his life, vocationally. You know, 36 years with Kerr Construction Company. You know, becomes the president of the company. 
and you know they they build roads and they build roads really really well i don't know if they ever got to name any of the roads that, that they built but you know god builds the road and he names the road he the road's name is jesus jesus said i'm the road i'm the way if you want to reach this distant destination if you want to get to the father you've got to travel by me so yeah i'm the truth yeah i'm the life but I am literally the road that will get you there. And as we're still at, at the beginning of a, of, of a year, as part of this introspection, as part of this resoluteness that we need to have and following Dell's example, you know, we need to really examine ourselves and find out, you know, first of all, confirm which road I'm on. And it's easy to know which road you're on. Am I in Christ? Am I outside of Christ? Is Jesus my Lord and Savior? Is he not? Have I confessed his name? Have I turned from sin? Have I been united with him in baptism to have him wash away my sins and give me his Holy Spirit and add me to his people? Am I walking in his steps? Am I following him? Not in perfection, but in persistence. Not flawlessly, ever, ever flawlessly. We've Every one of us has proven that. But faithfully, I can know that I'm on that road. But also t an opportunity maybe to, even on that road, consider how closely I'm paying attention to the way God wants me to live, the way God wants me to treat other people. That Thursday at the Y, clockwise Thursday, um, ended so beautifully I, I did the the I did the whole jog in the wrong direction and so now quite warmed up and worked up a sweat I went over into the free weight area and I don't know 15 20 minutes later I noticed this couple get to the top of the stairs I didn't go every day but every day I was there they were there so I'm assuming they're there every day it didn't matter what day I went I saw this couple there this older couple I was 32, so an older couple to me then was probably in their mid-50s, <laughs> smack dab where I am, you know, right now. Looking back on it, picturing them in their mind, I was thinking, yeah, they're probably in their mid-50s, mid-late 50s. This old couple, uh, you know, was there every day, so they were stretching, and, you know, there is, you know, I see them talking to one, and it's Thursday? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I can't hear them. I'm assuming this is what they're saying. Is it Thursday? Yes, yeah, Thursday. And they kind of assess the situation, and they look at the sign, and they look at everybody else. They look back at one another, and they start going clockwise around the track. There's probably 20, 30 people on the track going the other direction. And, you know, they just said, they, they weren't quite speed walkers, just a little dialed back from that. They walked rather fast, though, exaggerated arm movements. You know, they, they had this look of resoluteness and determination on, on, their, on their face. And what, But one thing they didn't do as they met people regularly going around the track, they didn't shake their heads in disgust or wag their fingers in people's faces. They didn't slap anyone upside the head and chide them for their ignorance. They didn't rake them over the coals for going the wrong direction. They simply strode with confidence and high energy and with smiles on their faces. They were happy to be going the way they were going. They didn't look mad about it. They didn't look mad at other people because they were going in the right direction. They smiled. They seemed to be happy about what they were doing and you can just guess the rest of the story. Within seconds, people started to turn around. As they would pass them and pass those smiling faces, people would just, you know. <laughs> and by the time they had made a lap, the entire track was going in the other direction. That's all they needed was just a little confirmation a little encouragement, a little assurance that now I do know what day it is. I can read signs 
and thank you for not hitting me or yelling at me or chewing me out or questioning my intelligence. But just thank, thank you for showing me what I need to do so that I can follow. You know, I didn't stand from the edge of the track pointing fingers, you know, and pointing at the sign and telling people what they needed to do. They just showed them which way to go. Jesus came not just to point the way, but to lead the way. So he says, follow me. As he calls disciples, that's his go-to line. Follow me. That's all you have to do. Do what I do. Step where I step. Treat people like I treat people. Let me show you how it's done. He is both the way, according to John 14, 6, and the gate of the sheepfold, John 10, 9. Uh, the title of the sermon comes from Robert Frost's poem, uh, The Road Not Taken, which begins, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the other growth, undergrowth. And so verse 2, and then so verse 3, and then verse 4. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Beautiful poem by, by Robert Frost. Um, long before Frost uh, was this principle in the Word of God, confirmed by Jesus, that yeah, there's, there's two roads here. One is heavily traveled and one is less traveled. And choosing that road less traveled is not just going to make the difference here. It's going to make the difference forever. It's going to make a difference eternally. So choose well. Choose wisely. Choose with discernment and with wisdom. If you haven't gotten on that road yet, get on that road. And never turn back, never leave. Uh, there are others traveling it with you. may not look like it sometimes. There are plenty others traveling that road with you. And if you need to accept Jesus this morning, uh, enter your heart, into your life, into your soul, have him wash away your sins in baptism, we would love to assist you with that. Uh, if you need to more resolutely commit to following that path, our, our shepherds will be here at the front to receive you as we stand and as David leads us in this song.